Just a little note that after I've finished with you, there is lunch to follow. So uh, anyone is welcome to come and join in uh, our lunch together. It's out there in the hall and uh, we have a good lunch here. So please come and enjoy it. The parties were big in those days. When they threw a party, they threw a real party. Well, they thought it was a real party. One king fed 63,000 people for three months. That's some party. Another fed 45,000 people for two months. That's not a bad party too. But the king that I'm going to talk about this morning fed a thousand people and uh, not for very long. Which might indicate the uh, decline of the kingdom. We'll read about it in Daniel chapter 5 and you've heard of this fellow before I'm sure. Daniel chapter 5 says, Belshazzar the king made a great feast to a thousand of his lords and drank wine before the thousand. Belshazzar, while he tasted the wine, commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which was in Jerusalem, that the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines might drink therein or therefrom, we would say today. Belshazzar was throwing a party. He could only muster a thousand. That doesn't seem much compared with some of the other kings of that era, who, as I say, had 63, 45,000, uh, one 28,000, another one 34,000, and for various lengths of time. Belshazzar was small by comparison, but it was going to be a great party. He had his friends there, he had his women there, and uh, he had the wine there. And parties in those days went well as long as the wine held out. And like many parties today, when the alcohol runs out, the party's over. And uh, that was the sort of party that Belshazzar liked. So I've entitled a sermon today, how about drinking from the sacred vessels? How about drinking from the sacred vessels? Belshazzar <coughs> decided it would be a great opportunity to bring all of the gods of his knowledge, most of whom, of course, all of whom were really fictitious, but in his mind were real, to bring them into the, uh, uh, the party and uh, to have this great celebration. And one God that needed to be celebrated was the God of the Hebrews who had been long forgotten in the kingdom since the time of Nebuchadnezzar. The God of the Hebrews had been virtually forgotten. And so he brought out the golden and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple which was at Jerusalem. We have to realise the situation here. Belshazzar was actually the grandson not by blood, uh, well, I um, probably, yeah, there would have been some blood relation, I suppose. Um, Nebuchadnezzar's son um, was probably married to, a, sorry, Nebuchadnezzar's daughter was married to an Egyptian, and this Egyptian uh, and the daughter had uh, Belshazzar. So Belshazzar is really a grandson. Uh, of, uh, Nabonidus, uh, Nab of, of Nebuchadnezzar, the son of Nabonidus. And so uh, that's not so material except for the fact that it shows that there's one, two, three stages down the line and uh, Belshazzar has, uh, <coughs> has taken over the throne of Nebuchadnezzar who is mentioned frequently in scripture and in other writings. Belshazzar is not. As far as we know today, there are only two references to Belshazzar outside of the scripture in, in other writings and tablets that have been discovered. And it was thought that he didn't exist, but he, he clearly did exist. But he was no great significance and did nothing fantastic except 
that uh, he wanted at this time, at this party, to do something that would in some way perhaps have something to do with the God of the Hebrews, which uh, Nebuchadnezzar had a lot to do with, but uh, as you will see, he did it all in the wrong way. Verse 3 says, They brought the golden vessels that were taken out of the temple of the house of God, which is Jerusalem, and the king and the princes, his wives and his concubines, drank in them. They drank wine, and they praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, and of wood, and of stone. This was a pure heathen uh, outfit. In the same hour came forth fingers of a man's hand and wrote over against the candlestick upon the plaster of the wall of the king's palace, and the king saw the part of the hand that wrote, and the king's countenance was changed, and his thoughts troubled him, so that the joints of his loins were loose, and his uh, knees smote one against another. His knees knocked together in terror, for this was an omen. Such a thing in their thinking in those days was an omen. They uh, had all kinds of ideas in the Babylonian religion and uh, one of them was that when something appeared ghostly it was an omen not for good but for ill. And so he recognised this as an omen for ill but he didn't understand what it was. He knew something bad was about to happen. It scared the wits out of him. The king cried aloud to bring in the astrologers and the Chaldeans and the soothsayers. These were all the... uh, the fellows who could supposedly foretell the future and interpret dreams, and Nebuchadnezzar had to do with them many, many years before, and it was discovered that Daniel was the only one who was able to handle these kinds of dreams and these unusual occurrences and make sense of them. But uh, he promised them, in verse 7, later part, to be clothed with scarlet and have a chain of gold about his neck and that they should be the third ruler in the kingdom if they could interpret what the strange apparition was which wrote on the wall of (coughs) the building in which they held the party. And they all came together in verse 8, but they couldn't read the reading. And then the king greatly troubled and his countenance changed in him and uh, his lords were astonished. They were perplexed. Now verse 10 tells us, Now the queen, by reason of the words of the king and his lords, came into the banquet house, and the queen spake and said, O king, live forever. Let not thy thoughts trouble thee, nor let thy countenance be changed. There is a man in the kingdom in whom the spirit of the holy God is the spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of thy father, light and understanding and wisdom who were found in him, whom the king Nebuchadnezzar, thy father, uh, (coughs) made master of the magicians and the astrologers and the Chaldeans and the soothsayers. For as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding in interpreting of dreams and showing of hard sentences and dissolving of doubts were found in the same Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar, now let Daniel be called, And he will show the interpretation. Daniel had not been in great significance in the kingdom for some time. Belshazzar had virtually forgotten the history of his people. He had forgotten the history of his relatives and the history of (coughs) Nebuchadnezzar. You would think that uh, history uh, as Nebuchadnezzar's history was, where he had done so many strange things himself, and where so many strange things had happened to him, such as being turned into the likeness of an animal, as far as lifestyle goes, for seven years, to wander around eating grass and to sleep under the oak trees at night um, would be remembered for a long time in the kingdom. Perhaps they didn't record such uh, negative things about the kings. But Belshazzar, being a party boy, had not worried too much about studying his history. If he had studied history and done it thoroughly, he would have also known something else. He would have also known that it was almost time for the Jewish people to be freed from the slavery or at least uh, the, uh, the captivity of the Babylonians. They weren't exactly slaves in the full sense of the word while they lived in Babylon. But Nebuchadnezzar had captured the Jews 
some good number of years before, almost 70 years before, and had taken them to Babylon in a couple of different droves. And uh, most of the significant people in the Hebrew nation of Israel were taken over to Babylon. And it was just about time for them to be released. For Jeremiah, the prophet, who had uh, uh, knowledge of, of uh, God's plan for the Jews, had told that they would be released after 70 years. And Daniel had made reference to that. And if Belshazzar had done his homework over the years and had listened to all of the uh, cultures uh, and the history of the people whom he was supposed to be in control of, he would have known that the Jews were shortly to be released from the oppression that goes with being a conquered people. They would be allowed to return again to Jerusalem and set up their kingdom there again. But he didn't know that and didn't seem to understand it. And if he had, he might have acted somewhat differently. It wasn't an opportune time to belittle the God of the Hebrews. It was just the wrong time. You know that down through history, God has had significant stages where it is more particular to be, <clears throat> more important to be particular about our relationship and our treatment of God. And if you look down through the Bible in history, you will see where those circumstances occur. And uh, of course, the flood is one of those occasions because God had threatened to destroy the world with a flood. And that was a time when it was of particular significance for people to listen to Noah and to Methuselah and, uh, and to others who preached the impending doom of whatever the nation was in those days unless they repented and respected God. And then you, you come on and it's significant uh, when you come to the release of the Hebrews from Egypt, it was important that the Pharaoh listen to Moses and to Aaron because his people, God's people, were shortly going to be released from the oppression of slavery in Egypt. And it was very significant. And God saw that uh, people would need to take particular heed and be obedient to him at that time, otherwise they would lose this opportunity of being released. God does work through political entities. God does work through the ordinary things and comings and goings of humanity in life, and God uses them, and God adjusts them sometimes, and God um, <clears throat> puts things in place in, into the minds of kings and rulers and governments so that God's people can benefit. And uh, you'll remember the exactness with which the people had to kill the lamb at the Passover and put the blood on the door pillars and across the, the, uh, the door, above the door. It had to be done. It had to be done precisely. Not just one pillar, not just across the door, but all three had to do, it had to be done for. And uh, so we could list others where there are certain times that it is particular that, uh, that we know what God's plan is. And Daniel had said that he had studied the book of Jeremiah, the prophet, and he knew it was time for God's people to shortly be released. It was not a time to be playing around with God and with God's people and with the things that represented the holiness of God, the true God. And these <coughs> vessels from the temple were the vessels that represented aspects of the holiness of God. And here they're being used by Belshazzar and his party people to, uh, for an enjoyment which uh, was largely gained through drunkenness, a debasing enjoyment. Enjoyment that comes from the fallen human nature where the lowest part of humanity finds enjoyment in that which is indecent and immoral and disgusting and uh, ungodlike. We could simply say sinful. And so here we see that they are mixing the sacred 
with the common, the sacred, profaning God's name with that which was common and debasing. If Belshazzar had learnt the lessons of history, as his wife told him, he would have perhaps not died that night. And as the poet said, colourless and formless Belshazzar lay, a robe of purple wrapped a lump of clay. That night Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, in his own streets lay, dead, never to live again. Some people have noted, even in poetry, perhaps even non-believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, the significance of what Belshazzar had done. Verse 13 tells us that Daniel was brought in before the king. The king spake and told him the problem, and Daniel has a little word or two to say to the king. Verse 17, Then Daniel answered and said before the king, Don't worry about your gifts. I don't need a gold chain around my neck. I don't need some new clothes. I don't need to be the third ruler of the kingdom. He says, But thou, <coughs> king, the most high God, gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father a kingdom and majesty and glory and honour. And for the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations and languages trembled and feared before him, whom he would slay, he slayed, and whom he would keep alive, he kept alive. And those he set up, uh, he did, and those he put down, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up and his mind hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took his glory from him. And he was driven from the sons of men, and his heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild asses. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of, of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men, and that he appointed over it whomsoever he will. And thou, his son, O Belshazzar, have not humbled thine heart, though you knew all this. You've lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven. And so he goes on to explain to him where his sin lies. And uh, then he says, Then, 24, the part of the hand sent from him, and this writing was written, this is the writing that was written, Mene, Mene, Tikal, Ufasen, and this is the interpretation of the thing. Mene, God hath numbered thy kingdom and finished it. Tikal, thou art weighed in the balance and art found wanting. And Perez, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. And Belshazzar understood what it all meant. Belshazzar knew that his kingdom was over. His kingship was done. That night, it says in verse 30, was Belshazzar the king of the Chaldeans slain, and Darius the Median took the kingdom, being about three score and two years old. That was the last night. The last night for Belshazzar will maybe be repeated many, many times over. The last night for Belshazzar will be the experience for many, many people, I'm sorry to say, because they have failed to acknowledge that which is sacred and have profaned that which was sacred and used it for the common. <clears throat> Belshazzar could have done better. He could have listened to history and uh, seen where the leading of God with the Jewish people in particular, but so with some other nations as well, had <clears throat> led them to be better or to fail when they ignored his leading. History could have helped him. He could have listened <clears throat> to the right people. But he chose to go to his heathen, pagan, soothsayers, witches we might call them today, people who purport to be able to foretell your 
uh, destiny, your future. He went to people whom God had condemned as being only fit for death. And he got the wrong information or no information at all. He went to the blind to be led and they could show him no light. He was not aware of the condition in which he was now in under the influence of alcohol and his brain was unclear. He thought that he was in the heights of intellect when actually he was in a state of confusion. He could have gone to someone who could answer his question. There was a prophet amongst them and Daniel was still there. Daniel doesn't seem to feature a lot in the things of Babylon after the first few chapters recorded there. He seems to fade out of the scene and then he comes back in with the prophecies later and doesn't seem to feature much in the political scene as far as the story goes, but we do know <coughs> that he must have had some influence. But during the time of Belshazzar, he seemed to have been forgotten except for Belshazzar's wife. He knew that there was still a prophet there who was uh, reliable, whose conclusions, whose uh, information was factual and who could enlighten him. There was a prophet amongst them and he had neg <laughs> neglected to use the one whom God had ordained to portray secret knowledge. Knowledge that would not otherwise be obtainable except from an all-knowledge omniscient God. Belshazzar seemed to have got it all wrong. He seemed to take the sacred things, not just the vessels, but the sacred things that pertain to the philosophical part of our life and use them all the wrong way. And that's really what I want to talk about more this morning is about how we use the sacred things that God gives us. We don't have the sacred vessels today. The only vessels that we might use in the church today is the little jug and the little glasses that we use for the communion service and two little dishes or four little dishes that hold the bread for the communion service. We need to treat everything that is in God's house with respect because it belongs to God. It doesn't belong to us. But uh, that's not so significant as in this instance where the, the uh, vessels of God's temple had a direct representation regarding God, the true God. And if we take the sacred vessels of philosophy, if I can put it that way, the sacred vessels that have to do with our religion, our relationship with God, if we take them and use them with the same attitude as Belshazzar did, then we will one day be facing our last night and our doom will be just as sure and certain. We live in a time when we know that soon we will be released from the bondage of the sinful world. We, like the Jews, are waiting for that time, we don't have a prophetic date for it like they had back there, but we are waiting for the time when we will be released from the oppression of a sinful world. And how are we going to take uh, that which the Lord has given to us, and we can call these things the sacred vessels if we like, and uh, how are we going to take them and use them as we await the time when the Lord will return? and give us our true home and our true kingdom. Other things that God has given us used for purely selfish enjoyment, for pure hedonism. Or are we using that which God has given us for the benefit of others and the glorification of his kingdom and for the uplifting of Jesus Christ and the uplifting of our God? I think of the things that can be done uh, in the, uh, the church circles today, probably more than in any other era 
the things that we can do in relation to the church circles, and I'll mention some of them. One of them, of course, is uh, that uh, very important rite of baptism. And I think of baptism today. Is baptism going to be used by way of a fad, or is it going to be used by way of a sign of conversion? We need to be careful about this, because I'm concerned myself as a minister that we find people taking baptism lightly, and no one should be taking baptism lightly. They should be taking it knowledgeably, knowing that uh, baptism is an indication that we have confessed our sins and we acknowledge our sinfulness and we want our sins to be removed from us and uh, that we want to serve the Lord in the best possible way. And so I'm very cautious about baptising people who do not have an understanding of this. If they don't have an understanding of it, they should not be baptised because baptising is like having a sacred vessel. And if we use that sacred vessel for popularity reasons or for fad reasons, let me tell you a little illustration on this. When I was baptised, I was baptised with 16 others. Today, there are only two of them left in the Adventist church or in a church at all. And uh, at least half of those 16 who were baptised were only baptised because the minister was a flatterer. They were women and the minister flattered the women. And I say that quite frankly and boldly, and I could even name the minister, but he's, uh, he's not alive now, so he can't answer me back. So I don't think it's fair to name him. But uh, he flattered those women. They were my relations. And he flattered them. And uh, they were baptised. But they were a burden to themselves and to the church ever afterwards. Why? Because they had not understood that baptism means confession, acknowledgement of your sinfulness and uh, that you need a new relationship with God and that you will be a dead soul unless you bring yourself into relationship with God and accept his righteousness and clean up your act in life. <clears throat> so much for that. What about employment? Employment, do we use the sacred opportunities of employment that the church offers today? Do we use that to glorify God or do we use it because it's an opportunity for a good job and a good pay or for, for a status. Um, the opportunities for service are so much greater in the church today and yet they can be misused. It's a sacred vessel and it can be misused for self. And then there's recreation. Recreation is good and there's more opportunity for recreation these days than ever there has been in the time of history as far as the Western world's concerned. In fact, people are now saying, those who know, Supposed to know and now saying that we have far too much time for recreation. And I tend to agree with that. And uh, because of that, we're running into a lot of trouble. Are we using our time, that sacred vessel that God has given to us? Are we using it for ourselves in a selfish way and uh, praising the gods of, uh, of society rather than praising God? And entertainment comes into the same sort of thing. As we think about entertainment today, entertainment is also a sacred vessel. There is a right way to entertain, a right way to enjoy uh, some spare time and to be entertained. And there is a wrong way. And today the church offers opportunities for some entertainment, but we need to be careful, very careful that it is not used in a way which will detract from our relationship with God. Herod was very interested in Jesus. You can read about it in, in Luke chapter 23. Herod was very interested in Jesus. It says that he had longed to meet him. He wanted to meet him. And Herod met Jesus. And uh, he thought, this is fantastic. And he says, Jesus, uh, work a miracle for us. Herod was a playboy. He spent most of his time playing and being entertained. Um, he was a playwright and he did all kinds of things that uh, people think is fantastic. He enjoyed himself to the full. He was always happy. And he met Jesus and he thought, this is fantastic. Jesus will work a miracle and I'll see something that I can talk about for ages. Jesus, work us a miracle. And Jesus didn't say a word. Jesus didn't work the miracle. 
Jesus doesn't work miracles to entertain people. No, Jesus works miracles to uplift <coughs> his Father. That's why he works miracles, to uplift us before his Father. Let's be careful with entertainment. What about worship? This is a tough one, isn't it? What about worship? The sacred vessel of worship. The Lord has given us a great privilege in allowing us to worship him in spite of the fact that we are sinful uh, beings, so far fallen from that which he created in Adam and Eve. And yet he allows us to worship him. And he wants us to worship him. He wants us to acknowledge him. But do we take this sacred vessel sometimes and uh, we turn it into a, or misuse it in a way that uh, <coughs> gives no credit to God? I fear in the church today there is a severe, serious risk of us being careless in this regard. When we come to worship, we have the privilege of having a place of worship. But do we always treat it as a place of worship? Or does it sound more like a bazaar? I tend to think of something we could pull our socks up on a good deal. When we come into the church so often, and before we leave the church so often, you would think we had just been to an exciting auction sometimes. Is that true? It's true, isn't it? We need to be careful. It's a sacred vessel. Do we use it for sacred purposes? What kind of music do we use with this sacred vessel? A sacred vessel of music. One of the most moving uh, and em uh, of all emotions is, uh, is music. And how do we use music? I tend to feel that so much music today is available to us and is heard even on so-called Christian channels <coughs> today that we get conditioned to hearing music that is more suited to the nightclub in its mode and uh, expression than is suited for the worship of God. We need to be careful about this. What about our conversation? What about our conversation? What about punning the scriptures? You ever hear people make these little jokes about scripture? I've heard so many of them and at times I've laughed about them because they are witty and I've come to the conclusion that it is using a sacred vessel for a uh, in, in a form of profanity. And uh, I've decided that I will not use them anymore. And uh, you know the kind of jokes that I'm talking about. Using the scripture to get humour out of, punning words, punning situations, making the scripture into a joke. What about education? Education. What will education do for us? The church offers education here, there and everywhere. You can go across the world and you can find Seventh-day Adventist educational institutions. One of the things that we were advised to do by Ellen White was to set up educational institutions. They are sacred vessels and we can use them for good or for ill. We can use them so that we can be better fitted for the service for God, or we can use the Adventist education system for our own personal selfish use. When I was at college, comes time to graduate and getting close to graduation, you see the fellows all looking through the newspapers every morning at the situations vacant in the Sydney Morning Herald and the Brisbane Post and various others. And they're sitting in the library looking through all these papers, passing these pages to each other. And uh, several of the guys there I knew quite well who came from certain parts of the world were looking for these, uh, looking in these ads. And I said to a couple of them, I said, um, you've been sponsored by your church or your conference to come to Avondale and to train for the ministry or train for uh, accounting uh, business or train in nursing or whatever it is. And uh, they say, yes, yeah, the conference has, has paid for us. And I knew some of these guys, a um, couple from New Zealand, I know the conference paid for um, to go to college. And they were looking for jobs out there in the community. And the church had wanted them to come back and work for the church. But uh, they had trained in, the, in Avondale College and got a true, really good, recognised education, but decided that they would use it for their own selfish uh, in grandismant. And many of these people didn't go back to their home countries and work there 
which had, who had paid for them, they went and got jobs out in the secular world. I don't say that they were bad uh, Christians for that. They probably lived good lives. But uh, I thought to myself how sad it is that our educational institutions will be used for the wrong purposes. I know there was secular work, the secular work to be done. But when the church has paid for one to come and be educated, surely you owe something back to the church, at least a few years' service. Education can be a sac- is a sacred vessel, but it can be used for the wrong purposes. We're a people waiting to be released from this world of sin, a world of uh, confusion, a world of heartache, a world which is uh, <coughs> so evidently influenced by the devil and his evil forces. We were people waiting to be released, waiting for that prophetic moment, although the date is not set, that prophetic moment when Jesus returns and takes his people to be with him. We have the blessing of having a prophet amongst us. We have the blessing, the greatest blessing that the church has ever had down throughout history. The greatest blessing is that we have a complete scripture. We have a complete history of God's people and his dealing with them. We have a complete history of Jesus working uh, (coughs) and Jesus working uh, for his people, which we call the New Testament. We have the blessing of a prophet amongst us in the writings that Ellen White has blessed us with, with the insights and the uh, direct directions that she has pointed the church in. And is there any excuse for us to take the sacred vessels that God has given us and to use them purely for common purposes? I say there's no excuse. As we look forward to Jesus coming, let's ensure that we can say we have used what you have given us for your honour and glory. And hear those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant, enter into the joy of thy Lord. Let's close our service with the use of him, it may be at morn, and uh, it has a number in the hymn book. I think it's uh, 207. 207, if you're using a, a hymn book. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have given us the opportunity of seeing what history has done, what history can tell us. We pray that we will learn from it. We pray that we will indeed be people who are safe to take to your kingdom when Jesus comes. And we know that that will be through your grace and your working in our hearts and in our lives. Dismiss us today, we pray, with a desire to be uh, honest in our relationship with you and to trust in your salvation, for we are saved by your grace. We thank you for it and pray it please in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.